Hello. In the left jar, I have a little bit of oil, and in the right jar, I have a little bit of table salt, or NaCl. What happens when I add water to each? You probably already know what happens. You can see here that the oil is not mixing with the water. It's forming little bubbles, and actually, if you're careful, you can see a layer of oil on top of the water. Now, salt does dissolve in water. Perhaps I add a little too much salt and a little too much water, and it just spilled all over the note I made. Well, too bad for me. Salt does dissolve in water. Why is there a difference between the two chemicals? Well, in order to answer that, you have to f understand the process of dissolving in the first place. So you're gonna begin with a solute. That's the thing that is dissolving into another, and you're gonna begin with a pure solvent, which is what you're going to dissolve into. Now the process of getting those two substances to mix comes in three parts. The first is that we break apart the molecules, or in some cases, ions of the solute. The thing you are trying to dissolve needs to be broken up into tiny, tiny pieces, almost as small as they can go so that they can spread themselves around the solvent. That process requires energy. You need to put energy in to separate those molecules or ions from each other. The second thing you need to think about is breaking apart the molecules of solvent. Now you're not fully breaking these apart. It's more like you're opening up little pockets within them. You're separating them just enough that you can jam a solute particle in there. In order to get a sodium ion to fit inside water, water has to open up just the tiniest bit so the sodium ion can fit in there. Separating those waters from each other also requires energy. But the payoff is that when you mix the solute and solvent, the solute broken apart into ions or molecules and the solvent with little pockets already made, when those interact, you can get intermolecular forces and stuff, attractions between each other, and that process releases energy. So some energy is required up front to get these things to break apart from each other, but when they mix back together, if they are attracted to each other enough, they release enough energy to make it dissolve. Here's the summary. If more energy is released in that third step than was absorbed in the first two steps, then in general, the substance will dissolve. Here's a diagram I already drew for you about salt dissolving in water. And take a look. All my, my salt is almost all gone. I just needed to give it some time. Salt does dissolve in water. Solid sodium chloride will mix with the water. Now, let's take a look at those three processes, which I color-coded for you. The first is to separate the solute into its ions. This is an ionic compound, that's why it breaks into ions. Na and Cl in an ionic solid, combined together, bonded together with ionic bonds, get broken apart. To separate those two ions, and they're in an, uh, an ionic lattice, so it's not just breaking one bond between an Na and a Cl, but in any case, you're breaking them into separate ions, Na plus and Cl minus. That requires some energy, and just like a roller coaster, you need to put some energy in to push it up the initial hill. Then you need to be able to make pockets within your solvent. So I haven't really changed my H2O is still H2O here, and my solute, which was broken into ions, is still broken into ions. But this H2O is different from this one because this one now has little tiny pockets that the Na and Cls can go into, theoretically. That also required some energy. We had to break some hydrogen bonds in order to make those pockets within the water. So that requires us to push the roller coaster up in energy a little more. So far, we've put in energy to break apart the solute and put in more energy to break apart the solvent. Now comes the payoff. What happens when you mix Na pluses and Cl minuses into those pockets within the water? 
Well, I have great news for you. Na and Cl have very strong ion dipole forces with water. Their charges are just plus and minus one. They're not too small and they're not so big that they require a lot of waters around them, etc. Na and Cl are very attracted to the waters, or maybe I should say the waters are very attracted to the Na plus and Cl minus. It's called an ion dipole attraction because the dipole of the polar water molecules is attracted to the plus or minus charge of these ions. What a payoff! Energy is released when those ion dipole attractions are formed. And net, we had to put in energy, sure, but we got so much out that net there was a release of energy. Take a look at how I've shown my potential energy here. Most teachers will have like a zero written somewhere and then the rest of these are negative numbers. I'm doing this for your benefit here. Down lower on a potential energy diagram is more stable and up higher is less stable. So you've got to do some work to get there. But the payoff for, tr for actually being able to get there is high. And so NaCl will dissolve in water provided the temperature's high enough. Huh? You need enough energy to make these two processes happen before you can get the payoff from this one. Now, oil in water is a different case. Now, I actually have a different ionic compound here, but you can think about it as being oil. To separate oil molecules from each other, oil molecules themselves are actually really easy to pull apart, so let's not worry about that. This PBS is an ionic compound with a plus two and a minus two charge. That requires a lot more energy to separate them from each other. You still have to create pockets within the waters. So you still have this, this pink jump that we've seen before. But then the attractions between the PB plus twos in waters and the S minus twos in waters are... I mean, they're there, and so there is a release of energy, but it's not nearly as um, substantial as it was for Na plus and Cl minus. These are, well, that one's kind of close in size to Cl, but the charge is double. So you kind of require more waters in order to surround it and stabilize that charge. PB is just straight up large. It's a big like fifth or sixth row element, so many shells of electrons. The point is that the waters that are trying to dissolve these ions are having a tougher time. They're not quite as attracted to it. And so the payoff isn't as large. For this chemical, the separation of the ions provided too much of a barrier to even possibly get to the aqueous or dissolved phase. Oil, on the other hand, is actually a little slightly different. Oil has a very short phase here and the same size phase here because this, again, this is us putting the, the pockets in the water, but then the green attraction between water and oil is almost nothing. So you have to put in energy to break apart the oils, put in energy to create the pockets of the water, and you get no payoff. Why would a chemical process do that? It wouldn't. Now, let me reiterate that in words for you in case you're being asked to explain how salt dissolves in water. Remember, the processes are, step one, break apart the solute. So NaCl solid breaks apart into Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. Okay, cool. The second step is that some of the hydrogen bonds within the water solvent break to make pockets that those ions can go into. That also requires some energy. But then the Na plus ions get surrounded 
And we have a special word for that in chemistry. It's called solvated to produce Na plus Aq. Now you're probably not responsible for how many waters that takes, but it takes about six waters to surround it fully. And in ad addition, Cl minuses get solvated. The water solvent molecules surround it as well. I think it's also about six. And that finally lets you write the Aq on it as well. These ion dipole attractions are so strong that it makes the entire process spontaneous. Now, just to be clear, this was us breaking hydrogen bonds, which are an intermolecular force. You're not breaking the waters into hydrogens and oxygens. You're just separating two H2Os away from each other. And here, in theory, you're breaking ionic bonds. Now, those are tough to break in general, although they are tougher for smaller and higher charged particles. The plus one and minus one mean that when it comes to breaking the ionic bonds here, these aren't too bad. A plus two minus two would be tougher. Um, a, a lithium with a fluorine would be tougher simply because they're smaller so they can pack closer together and then they're tougher to separate, separate away from each other. The point is that you have to put energy in to break those ionic bonds. You have to put in energy to break these hydrogen bonds within the waters, but then the ion dipole attractions that are made by mixing those ions with the solvent themselves are strong. And so overall, this process is favored to go forward and create the aqueous version. Now, what about candle wax or something in water? Well, candle wax molecules are actually not that tough to separate from each other. Now, this is just what we, well, one example of something that's in wax. I think it was called hentriacontane or something. Wikipedia gave it to me. It's a non-polar chemical, so you're breaking really only what we call London dispersion forces to separate the wax molecules from each other. Just like we have said every time before, we need to break some hydrogen bonds in water to form pockets where the wax molecules would go. And then we try to mix the wax molecules with the water. But unfortunately, wax, which is non-polar, has hardly any attraction to the polar water molecules. In fact, water molecules would rather stick together than allow a wax molecule to get in there because the hydrogen bonds that they make with each other are so strong they don't want to get broken for some lackluster attraction that they're feeling with the wax molecule. The most important process here is probably this. There's more energy required to break the hydrogen bonds of water than you're getting as a payoff to mix the solid and solvent. That's why wax doesn't dissolve in water. Get it? I want you thinking about this process whenever you're asked if something dissolves. You have to put energy in to break apart the solute, put more energy in to make pockets within the solvent, and then you get some amount of payoff from mixing the two together. Ions in water will generally give you some payoff. Nonpolar things in water will hardly ever give you a payoff. And sometimes ionic compounds are already, like those ions are so attracted to each other that the payoff isn't quite worth it. You have to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what chemical you're being asked about. Thanks for sticking with me. 
and best of luck.